Hello everybody, I'm uh, Jakub, this is Piotr. We're gonna tell you about testing in production. So, um, fortunately today the debate on when to deploy changes the, to production has been finally uh, settled and we know that the best time to do that is Friday afternoon. We'd like to make a step further and today in this presentation argue in favor of using the production environment uh, for testing. So, um, uh, we're going to lead you through our journey uh, in AstroDB to uh, um, how, uh, how we apply this uh, testing in production paradigm um, in AstroDB. Okay, so the first thing is why, why actually we would like to do that, uh, how to do that, what are the challenges along the way, and how it, does it work in practice. So, why would we want to test in production? Cassandra has all these levels uh, of testing from very simple unit tests through node tests to more uh, complex integration tests that, that involve multiple nodes uh, and finally some uh, performance or stress tests. But all these tests, they uh, share the trait that they work on synthetic workloads. And uh, for data stacks as a vendor of uh, Cassandra as a service, um, it is important to uh, perform additional testing uh, because we have plenty of users and every user brings unique workload, unique use cases. And so uh, it is really a benefit if we are able to perform additional testing using these real life uh, workloads. The more conventional approach to do these kinds of tests would be to model the uh, workloads and have some synthetic workloads that are um, similar to real life workloads. Now the problem with this approach is that um, modeling real life workloads is time con consuming. Uh, the models are always approximate and um, they are usually outdated. Like by the time you actually start using the mod modeled workload, uh, the user might have already changed its original work workload. And finally, it is pretty difficult to be, uh, to be able to tell what is the actual impact of some particular change uh, to, for example, performance impact uh, to the user workload. If you only have synthetic workloads, then um, you can't really go to the user and say, okay, so we're now having this fix and it improves your latency by 20%. You really cannot do that. Now, um, testing in production, it brings new risks on the table as tinkering with uh, the production environment uh, you may uh, impact the availability of your services. Uh, you can uh, uh, negatively uh, impact the performance and obviously there is a security component to consider. Okay, so we settled on using the shadow deployment uh, approach for uh, testing in production and in the most abstract terms, you can think of that as um, having a clone of a primary system, uh, and we will call that clone shadow system. And there is some magic in between the user and the primary system. This magic allows you to, uh, to uh, send this user load to the shadow system, and then you're able to uh, analyze this shadow system behavior um, uh, for any bugs, for performance regressions. Um, essentially, this shadow system, you can think of it as a, a system with a different version of software or maybe different configuration, but it, it should reflect the, the primary system. Okay, so how, how should this magic part look like? What, what, what should it do? So there are basically two requirements. One is that it should work with uh, CQL traffic, obviously. And the second thing is that it must not impact the real production load. It must not impact the user. 
And this translates to <coughs> reliability. It must be super re reliable. It must have minimal performance impact. It should be uh, secure. There should be no uh, new security risks. And it should be robust. So it should perform in a predictable way uh, in adverse conditions. OK, so we reviewed uh, the existing solutions for shadow deployment. And there is plenty of them, but typically they are oriented uh, or mm, their pur purpose is to be higher up in the stack. Like they usually focus on HTTP traffic, which means that they um, interpret HTTP uh, requests. They are able to uh, manipulate headers, manipulate cookies, uh, so that uh, HTTP sessions work correctly. And this is something that doesn't uh, interest us. Uh, on the other hand, they miss uh, robustness features. Like most of them, they don't seem to care about what should happen if, if something goes wrong. Um, it is not clear how reliable these solutions are. Like you would have to spend time uh, looking into them, maybe finding some bugs. And the same goes with security. So fortunately, um, the CQL traffic is uh, very mirroring friendly. So there is very little uh, state that a CQL session has. Uh, there are use statements, there are prepared statements. But for example, prepared statements are implemented in such a way that the prepared statement ID uh, doesn't really depend on the place where you can put it. So, uh, both in the primary uh, system and in the uh, shadow system, the, the prepared statement IDs will be the same. So further executes, they, they will have no problem with being executed in either way, uh, in either of the systems. So when you think of it, there's actually nothing that prevents you from doing a very simple uh, duplication of the traffic in binary form. So, this meant that we, we, we settled on the following uh, architecture. Uh, for every uh, Cassandra node in the primary system, we have a corresponding node in the shadow system. And there is a t simple TCP proxy in front of uh, the primary Cassandra node. And uh, its purpose is to uh, pass the client traffic um, to the primary Cassandra node, but also duplicate it and send it to the shadow Cassandra node. Now, in case of Astra DB, this will be coordinator services. I'll talk about more of that later. Now, as already mentioned, we haven't found a suitable candidate for our TCP reverse proxy. So we decided to write it ourselves. And this is something that Piotr will tell you more about. Yeah, so when Kuba and the rest of the team uh, were investigating different uh, solutions um, for um, out of the for, for, for off the shelf uh, um, proxies and uh, couldn't find something that was matching our requirements, I thought to myself, okay, so how hard would that be actually to write a proxy? You take bytes from one socket and you copy them to two other sockets, right? What's more than that? This is look like a, well, weekend evening project. Uh, unfortunately, yeah, there are those challenges here. So this project on surface looks like a simple one, but uh, it has those additional robustness requirements, performance requirements uh, that constitute the majority of the complexity of this project. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, shadow coordinators, uh, they must be connected asynchronously uh, because uh, the primary traffic must not wait for the time uh, that shadow um, coordinator connects. Um, if the shadow coordinator is well broken or slow, uh, we must not hold the primary traffic because the primary requirement is the end user must not notice that there is something in the middle. Um, shadow coordinators, um, also may misbehave. They may block up, may, may, they may uh, slow down, they may not respond timely. 
Uh, they might also disconnect suddenly in the middle. So uh, error handling is, is very, very important in that project. Like we, we cannot just drop the whole session because Shadow uh, dropped the connection. Uh, also, uh, resource limits, uh, like okay, uh, asynchronous uh, communication with the Shadow requires some kind of buffering. But we must be aware of the fact that, okay, if we buffer too much data, uh, then uh, the container that we are running in might be simply killed because of exceeding some, some quotas, some, some limits. Uh, so having considered all those hard requirements and uh, the fact that uh, I've been writing high performance Java code uh, for Apache Cassandra and uh, DSC uh, data stacks for like more than 10 years now, a pretty obvious choice for me uh, to write uh, uh, was to write uh, the uh, shadow proxy uh, in Rust. Uh, so we get a, a simple Rust application that will be open sourced. It has the following uh, features. Uh, it of course can do that TCP traffic mirroring uh, to not just one shadow, it can actually do multiple shadows. That was a feature that wasn't planned, but actually turned out to be useful later. Uh, but it's very easy to add. Uh, it has uh, data buffering. So like if the shadow proxy, uh, if, if the shadow uh, coordinator is slow, uh, then we can buffer some data for it to replay later without slowing down the uh, primary traffic. Uh, it has also online reconfiguration. So like we can change the configuration without stopping the proxy. This is also very important. Like if you kill the proxy, you kill all the sessions. And of course the user would notice that. Um, the drivers are fortunately smart and they can reconnect automatically, but this introduces additional latency. Uh, and uh, of course we don't want to do that too frequently. Uh, so that's why we can change the configuration dynamically. Uh, it has all those memory and connection limits uh, so that uh, it can also protect itself from uh, being overloaded. For example, well, a customer could open thousands of connections and we must uh, uh, be ready to handle that and uh, we must not uh, overload uh, the system. Uh, it also supports metrics so like we can, when running that in production, of course, we want to see what's happening. Uh, as for performance, uh, yeah, it was written in Rust because of reliability, performance, uh, and uh, predictability of performance, like no GC running. Um, the architecture is thread per core, so it's very, very efficient. Um, we also could uh, uh, handle many, many thousands of uh, sessions in very low memory because Rust actually gives us the ability to control uh, how much data we allocate. It's extremely efficient uh, at that. Uh, okay, so as for the usage, this is a simple app, uh, single binary. Uh, for testing, we have a simple syntax where we can just uh, give it listen address, primary address, shadow addresses, one or, 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 or more. Uh, and uh, for production use case, uh, we have a config file. Um, this is a recommended way of writing that in production because the config file is monitored for changes, uh, so uh, you can change the file later or replace it, like delete the config file and, and create a new one. Uh, this directly maps to config maps in Kubernetes. So it supports also Kubernetes and, and works very well in, in that uh, environment. Um, you can see that when started, uh, the proxy uh, prints out uh, its version. Uh, when it was built, uh, also it uh, repeats the configuration. So this is a nice, uh, Feature actually, Kuba added that. Uh, that uh, uh, it's very important to 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 know uh, when you're running a production system, like what is it actually running? Like for example, you change the config, whether you actually pick the new config and and is the config correct? So this gives us a lot of uh, confidence uh, in, in 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 the software. Um, as for the configuration file, uh, okay, most of the stuff you probably don't want to touch. The defaults are good. Uh, probably the, the major parts, uh, beside of course configuring listing address and, and uh, primary and shadow addresses, uh, is to set uh, the memory limits. Uh, so we get a section for memory limits, like max memory and uh, max connections. 
Uh, and then there are some uh, other buffer sizes, uh, which are probably okay to leave as is. We, we tested that uh, and, and we find some, some uh, um, optimal uh, configuration parameters uh, that, that gave good performance. Uh, one more thing, uh, we want to run, because Cassandra is distributed, uh, we got multiple nodes. Uh, we wanted to be able to configure all the proxies for each coordinator just using a single config file. That's why we have uh, special sections uh, which are named like here proxy one and proxy two. You can just select which config you're running by additional flag config key. Uh, this is very handy in a Kubernetes environment so that we don't have to use separate or different config files for each kind of coordinator. Uh, as for the communication with the shadows, I said that this must not interfere with the primary traffic. So for example, when we are connecting to shadow coordinators, uh, we are doing that in background. Uh, until the shadow coordinator confirms the connection, we are simply buffering all the data on that connection for it. Of course, if ever uh, the buffer gets filled in completely, so we reach some limit, then we drop the uh, shadow connection, because we, we, we cannot continue to, to buffer more data. We, we don't want to kill the proxy. Um, also, uh, all the reads and writes for the shadow uh, stream, they are in non-blocking mode. Uh, so uh, even if the socket doesn't accept any data, we just simply immediately get the response from the system that, okay, zero bytes written, right? But we never never blocking the loop and we can still handle all the traffic on the primary um, stream. Uh, limits, uh, there are multiple limits. There's local limit per each session, like how much data we want to buffer for, for each co coordinator. Uh, but also there are global limits for the whole proxy, for all the sessions, in order to protect from you know, 100,000 sessions, for example, come. And, and even if each session uses kilobytes of data, this can actually translate to several hundreds of megabytes of data, or even gigabytes. Uh, so that's why we have a global memory limit and global connection limit. There are two types of limits. Uh, so for each, each memory and connection limit, we have hard limit and soft limit. Uh, when we exceed the soft limit, we disconnect uh, the shadows already. So like we never want to actually touch the hard limit. So hard limit, we always configure a bit higher so that we never touch that. But if ever such a situation happened, like the hard limit was touched, instead of uh, going above the limit, we would simply stop uh, accepting more connections or we even we start dropping the connections, even the primary ones. Like it's still better to not accept uh, uh, some uh, primary connections, but not lose the existing ones. Uh, if we didn't have a hard limit, then it would be possible that after you know, opening 100,000 sessions, everything dies and, and all the connections are dropped, which is, of course, a bad situation. Uh, and final feature, metrics. By the way, Kuba implemented all the metrics, which is uh, really useful. It turned out when we were doing those deployments in production, metrics were invaluable uh, in uh, um, showing us like, what's going on in the system. Um, so we track, uh, like for example, how many connections we have, uh, how much uh, uh, memory the proxy is using. Uh, we can see, for example, if the shadow coordinators were connected uh, properly. So like if, 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 if they accepted the connections, uh, we can see, for example, how much data is going on. Uh, so, so both uh, upload and, and download uh, on all, the, all of the uh, connections. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that's mostly, that's mostly it. We can also see, for example, like uh, if the data is not going uh, through, um, for example, well, it's not going to the shadow coordinators, we can see like uh, where is it block, blocked? Like is it, for example, blocked on writes or maybe it's blocked on, on reads? Uh, we also report uh, uh, those timings. And uh, the final thing, of course, we had to test the shadow proxy itself. So there were several layers of testing. Unit tests, uh, which uh, actually simulate all those scenarios of like bad behavior of, of shadow, disconnecting, slow uh, shadow. Uh, this is all automated, runs in just a few seconds. Uh, then of course, some end-to-end -end testing with a local laptop, but also real Astra clusters uh, with uh, bigger sets of data. Uh, we also 
try to stress test it, like it will really many, many connections, uh, many clients, trying to see how much uh, resources we really need to handle uh, the traffic. We earlier also checked uh, uh, how our production, uh, how many connections uh, are um, opened uh, in the production clusters. Um, so we wanted to have a pretty good margin uh, for uh, ab above that. So for example, uh, if our biggest cluster is using 10K connections, we wanted to be sure that we can handle you know, 30K connections. Um, so uh, um, especially we didn't want to, or we didn't, we weren't even allowed to, uh, increase the memory consumption or resource consumption on the production deployments. Um, so the proxy must fit uh, in existing infrastructure. Like you couldn't just say, okay, because of now we are doing shadow deployments, we need uh, twice bigger servers. Uh, that was a requirement from above. Like, yeah, you have some spare memory on those machines, but don't use too much. Um, so uh, we ended up with just using something like 150 megabytes per 10,000 sessions. And each session is three connections. So it's like a, actually 30K connections. Added latency, typically less than uh, 0, 0, 0.005 milliseconds, uh, which is nothing. I mean, this is, this is nothing compared to the typical latency of queries in Cassandra. So this is unnoticeable for users. Uh, and we can basically push gigabytes of data per second uh, even uh, on a single uh, single core, on, on, on a single connection. And with multiple connections, of course, with going multi-core, it's a multiple, multiple of that. So that's basically it. And Kumar. Okay, <laughs> so explain. with all these pieces uh, together, we managed to apply this to AstraDB. Uh, so if you attended Jake's uh, mm, presentation yesterday, you know that in AstraDB, the monolithic Cassandra nodes were smashed into uh, separate services. And so we are, are concerned with uh, coordinator services. So each coordinator ser service got its shadow proxy. And this shadow proxy lives very close to the coordinator service. Like they live in the very same pod. Um, but the uh, shadow database, it is isolated from the primary database. Uh, for example, it is not possible, it is physically not possible to access the shadow database from outside of the production environment, like from the internet. Um, now, obviously, the proxy alone is enough if you want to shadow a new database, but if you want to enable um, shadow deployment for existing database, uh, you need additional component. This is database cloning. So we have that. So we are able to provision uh, resources for the shadow deployment on demand. Um, and all this has been uh, live since March this year. Finally, we, we added for extra, extra security, we added this scram button. Uh, and if you press that button, the, all the proxies, they go, get bypassed. So uh, the traffic goes directly from the client to the coordinators, just like without any proxy. And actually, we, we needed to use it once when we misconfigured uh, the proxy. The, the hard limits were, were too low, and we started noticing, okay, some client connections can make, can't make it. So uh, let's press the scrum button, and we'll see what happened later. Uh, so yeah, that, that, uh, that, that is helpful. Okay, so we applied it in AstraDB. We found two bugs. Now, this may sound a bit scary, uh, but uh, this was actually on, on a version, like the shadow deployment contained a version uh, that you can think of as a very pre-alpha of Cassandra 5.0. Like, these bugs were found six months ago, so it's, uh, they would probably be found anyway. Now, we also use uh, this shadow deployment for evaluation of compaction changes. Uh, there's been a talk about uh, UCS. So UCS uh, has some further improvements that, that it needs. And so we're testing uh, how actually these improvements perform under real, li uh, re real life conditions. 
this is very valuable, I, and I, an, I encourage you to talk to Branimir about that. Finally, we learned that using this shadow deployment is so easy that some people started using it in dev environment. So in dev environment, we've got a database, and there is a suite of tests that runs against that database all the time. So if you want to perform some ad hoc testing with, for example, topology, whatever, uh, it's just easy to, to, to press a button to create the shadow deployment of that database and then play and tinker with, with the shadow, uh, shadow database. Now, one, one thing that is not so great is that the scrum button takes the thrill of adventure uh, away. So, you know, we're making changes to, to production and it, it, like if, if the proxy be behaves, we just press the button and no sweat. So there's no thrill. Okay, what, we, what we've learned along the way. Um, so Cassandra closes connections using reset, which means that if you uh, use the proxy, you will start seeing uh, connection reset by peer errors in the metrics. And this is fine, like this is the normal way. So uh, don't stress because of that. Um, fine, uh, another thing is that to make the proxy effective, you need new connections. So there are essentially two, two options. You can either wait until new connections are made by the client, or you need to sever the existing connection so that the client reconnects, and now the load goes via the proxy. So it's, it's a trade-off, and you need to make that call. Another thing, uh, stateless Kubernetes components, uh, that's great, but it's at odds with, with configuration of the shadow proxy where we want to have this one-to-one -one correspondence. So there is some tension there, and if you do, do that, uh, there may be some race conditions uh, that you run into, like you configure the shadow, but it doesn't seem to be working because some connections were uh, created before the, the um, mirroring was enabled. And uh, as I already mentioned, we needed to use the, the scrum button one, so please check, check if the resource constra constraints are, are, are set to reasonable values. Like if, you, if your uh, application creates so many connections uh, that, 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 is un that it is unusual, then you need to you know, take it into account when configuring the proxy. Um, Another thing that we learned, which uh, is maybe not that surprising, Rust really helped us writing uh, bug-free code. Like, uh, there is obviously this component of, of uh, Rust being performant language, but for us, uh, the, the biggest uh, benefit was that it was really easy to write code which uh, did not contain bugs. Okay, and you can try the shadow proxy yourself. We've got the demo. Uh, it is a very simple demo with two Cassandra nodes, but it shows how to uh, use shadow proxy. The shadow proxy itself will be open source very, very soon. Uh, so, yeah, you can look and hopefully contribute. Uh, finally, I would like to express my deepest thanks and kudos to uh, other people involved in the project. Uh, so Jim Dickinson, Matt Fleming, Dan Yatniex, Jeremiah Jordan, Sean McCarthy, and Chris Mills. Okay, thank you very much. Are there any questions? going to take that one okay I can take that one so the question is like uh, was performance the only consideration that uh, help us made us um, well help us made this choice uh, uh, for rust um, well no it, performance is just a side effect um, I feel like uh, the I mean Java is a pretty performant language anyway like like JVM does magic and, and does a lot of great stuff um, but uh, the type system of Rust, uh, which we could use without actually compromising on, on performance. So that, that 
seems like the really, really big, big thing for us because uh, in Java, if I use all the high level stuff like, hey, I can do use streams, I can wrap every primitive type uh, in a class and, and I get some level of type safety. Uh, but this all comes at a price perform at, at a, at a uh, big price in performance. Uh, like GC suddenly having too much work to do um, and, and causing maybe some pauses. Like here, even millisecond pauses were considered a bit too, too, too much for us. So with Rust, we can, could also use all of those high-level constructs, uh, but they still translate it to a highly performant code without any interruptions with no, no GC, low latency. So I think that this is, this is the biggest thing here. Yeah, also, also the tooling. But, well, but, but. tooling, uh, also uh, no data races. Um, yeah, that, yeah, that like one is also r r big. Writing uh, uh, asynchronous parallel code was like simple, like, like it should be. Yeah, many, many people criticize async in, in Rust as it's a bit complex, but it is complex to learn, but once you learn that, actually, okay, I don't have the slide, but uh, the main loop of this proxy is basically, as I said, it's just take data from one socket, copy that to, to other sockets, and that's it, and the, the loop is sequential. Like, we don't have to think about, you know, concurrent things happening to the buffer, like this buffer that keeps data for the shadow. It doesn't have to be protected by any mutexes or, or anything like that. We don't use any atomics there as well. Like this is just sequential code. Just put some data, read data from the socket, put it into buffer, then read it from the buffer, put it into another socket. It's very easy to, easy to reason about thanks to async and all the stuff in Rust that protects us from accidentally you know, sharing things between two threads. We, we won't do that accidentally and it would just not compile. So the question is like, do we want to also do this for internode traffic? And, and uh, I think that- well, Why would we want that? Why would, yeah. So, well, for us, the idea is that these systems, they need not be compatible, uh, like on this level, on, like in, internally, right? We, we don't need that. It's not like we want to uh, have a uh, heterogeneous system uh, with like two different versions and they talk to each other and want to check that. No, it's, yeah, it's like we're gonna do an upgrade next month uh, will it work? Will, 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 can we be sure or have you know higher uh, level of uh, of con confidence that we're not going to break anything in production? Well, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. I guess that depends on how the client does that. Uh, from, from our perspective, the proxy is, uh, is very, very lightweight. So the, the duplication, the network traffic, it happens you know, very close to, to, the, uh, to the database itself. So for example, you don't need to consider uh, the, the potentially long distance uh, between the client and two databases, but also also the client uh, drivers uh, they typically need to serialize the data. It's like translate from one representation to the representation that is uh, required by the CQL protocol. So like if you had two connections to two different clusters, I guess that you would duplicate that work. Maybe, I mean, maybe there are ways to avoid that with some drivers, but 
I don't recall any, any drivers which could do that, like to write to two different clusters. Here we do it just uh, on a very low level, so like byte streams, and uh, uh, that's why it's much more efficient. On the other hand, when you do, the, do this on the client side, then maybe you can think of getting some, uh, uh, some consistency between these two. So this, is not, this was not mentioned in the, in the yeah. presentation, but we did not aim for any sort of consistency between primary and shadow system. Like, don't, don't, don't think this is uh, any sort of you know, migration tool or anything. Yeah, we're not interpreting the traffic yet. There is a long-term plan that maybe in the future we will do some shallow interpretation, but for now this is just, just TCP. Okay, there's no, there's no more questions. Then thank you.